Hey students, Mrs. Dukoski here. We are about to start chapters three and four of Catcher in the Rye. We're gonna do those chapters together. We're still at Pensy Prep. Um, Holden is getting kicked out. That's our central conflict. So we know he's not gonna be there for long, but he's still at Pensy Prep for the beginning quarter of this novel. So chapter three and four, he's gonna go back to his dorm. So not to be confused, he is at a prep school. Um, it's a high school where he stays. So he is living there. It's not college though. So a lot of us don't really experience dorm life until we go to college, but um, this is a prep high school. So he's staying at his high school. So we will go back to his dorm and we'll meet two characters. One is the next door neighbor. His name is Ackley. We'll meet him first. And one is Holden's roommate, whose name is Stradlater. So each chapter kind of um, tells us about each of those characters. So chapter three is the Ackley chapter and chapter four is the Stradlater chapter. And I'm gonna just, you know, show you the notes and tell you what our focus is gonna be as we read these chapters. But I also wanted to point out, I have my Catcher in the Rye mug with me again. So just kind of like zoom in on it. This is a fun mug. Um, it's a checker piece, you see it? And they're going to, or hold in, J.D. Salinger's going to mention a character named Jane Gallagher. And um, she gets mentioned in these chapters. She'll get, you know, we'll hear about Jane Gallagher quite a bit. It's a girl that Holden knows. And um, it's the, my favorite quote, one of my favorite quotes from the book is Holden inquires um, with Stratlater, who is going to be seeing Jane Gallagher, Ask her if she still keeps her kings in the back row. So we'll talk about that as we get to it in the book. And um, this character, Jane Gallagher, again, is a girl that Holden knows. And they have played checkers together. And Jane has um, this strategy when she plays checkers where she keeps all of her kings in the back row. And we can analyze that, right? That's quite a defensive move on Jane's part. Um, but yeah, so there's that's where this mug came from and it's one of my favorites. So just a little fun piece of information um, before we get started. So I'm going to start my screen share again. It's helpful to go into Schoology, have that available, have the text available. Um, if you want a Word document, if that helps you too, but just get yourself set up so that you're ready for this lesson. And we will be again focusing on chapters three and four. So here I go with my screen share. I hope everybody's well out there. So here we are, screen sharing. Here's Catcher in the Rye. Again, your Schoology page might look a little different, but you're going to find your Catcher in the Rye folder. Everybody has one on their Schoology page. And you've got your online text, useful. And here's my chapter three and four notes. If you need to go back into chapters one and two, they're here for you as well, or even the introduction. Um, there's a PowerPoint, but we're moving on. So here's chapter three and four. So for chapter three and four, I'm going to view my notes, right? And I'm going to notice that, oh, look at this. Before I get started, if I'm feeling unfocused, Mrs. Dukoski is a big fan of what I call the B now, which is just taking five minutes to get yourself ready, prepared, like be in your learning space so that you are available to take in this lesson. It's going to be, you know, us reading a couple chapters together and talking about these characters. So make sure you're in a place where you feel focused to do that. So I've this time included um, a Get Focused Guided Breathing exercise. If you're not familiar with guided breathing, um, this is a great place to start. It's a nice, simple five minute um, Get Focused Breathing exercise. And you can just kind of hit up this link, pause this video, and take a few minutes to just kind of tune in and get present and prepare yourself for the lesson. So always important before you get started with your work. So if you'd like to pause, you can go ahead and do that. Try the get focused activity. And then once you come back to us, there's also a chapter two review video. So if it's been a few days and you just need to catch up on chapter two, there's a nice little quick, this is I think less than two minutes, video review of chapter two. 
you can pause this video before you start chapter three and four with me and catch up on chapter two, do a little review video. Mr. Spencer and Holden met at Mr. Spencer's house and had a conversation. So that um, YouTube video will review chapter two for you. So if you'd like, again, you can pause before we get started with chapters three and four. So chapters three and four, we're gonna focus on the element of character. We've talked about some characters. We have Holden as our narrator, right? So he's the main character, the protagonist. He, in these chapters, meets two characters, <clears throat> or we meet with him, he knows them, Ackley and Stradlater. These are their last names. Um, they live in the dorm, again, with Holden. Ackley is the next door neighbor. Stradlater is his roommate. We'll meet Ackley first. They are what we call foils. So in fiction, a foil is a character who contrasts with another character. So it's usually the protagonist, but in this case, it's these two, you know, that live in Holden's dorm. It highlights qualities of the other characters. So when you have these opposite characters um, next to each other, you really get to see the individual characteristics kind of come out more because you, you're, you know, showing it with the opposite of it. So that's the, the strategy that writers will use. Um, and then we're also going to examine characterization, and we'll have a little characterization activity to hand in, looking for that on Schoology, um, after this lesson is over. So characterization is how the writer describes the characters. So there's two types of characterization, indirect and direct. So there's a nice little um, worksheet here that talks about both of those, indirect and direct, and I think I have it up here. So... I can find it for you, and you can find this on your own, too. I would take a minute to look over this. Again, we are, like, activity that we'll need to hand in. Um, I'm going to try to make a fun little activity for you, but it will be about characterization. So you'll need to know the difference, and we'll be looking at it as we read these chapters. The direct characterization, which was when the author tells the audience exactly what the character is like. So, for example, the patient boy and quiet girl were both well-mannered and did not disobey their mother. How lovely, right? So this is directly telling us characteristics of those two, the boy and the girl. Indirect is when things are revealed about a character you know, based on um, things that are like less obvious, not direct telling. So something like speech, what the character is saying, how they speak, maybe their thoughts. We find out a lot about Holden, right, um, through his thoughts, because we have this stream of consciousness, it's called, where we're in his head. Um, the effect on others toward, or the effect on others toward the character. So the interactions, right, that are being revealed as this character has an effect on other people. Um, the way that they behave, the way that the emotions, um, actions also, and looks. What does the character look like? How, you know, does the character present themselves? So those would be indirect, where if the author is telling you exactly about this character, point blank, that's called direct. So we'll look at those as we read our chapter. And we're also going to get into just, you know, not digging too deep, because it's still sort of the beginning of the novel, but beginning to take notice, all right, so four was be on the lookout for a characterization assignment once we're done with this lesson, and five is let's start uncovering some themes. They've already sort of begun to like emerge in the first couple chapters, but uh, when you analyze a the theme, the theme is like the layers that you can peel back as the novel progresses. So in the beginning, you might catch glimpses, and then you should really start to uncover more as the story continues on. So we're still toward the beginning, but we see the start of some of these themes, you know, emerging in these chapters. So here's a list of some themes. So really, in the beginning of a story, you just want to start to take notice. Start to take notice when these themes begin arriving or where we can start examining them. And they're gonna be recurring. Again, themes recur throughout the story and kind of evolve. 
So that's just something that we'll start to look at, but we're, we're really gonna be focusing more on the character and characterization in chapters three and four. All right, so with that, I'm gonna go to my PDF. Here it is. Chapter three starts on page nine. I can find it by just clicking in here and popping in nine and pressing enter. And when you are ready, get yourself situated. You can follow with my screen, use your PDF, have your you know, hard copy available. Chapter three, I'm the most terrific liar you ever saw in your life. It's awful. If I'm on my way to the store to buy a magazine, even, and somebody asks me where I'm going, I'm liable to say I'm going to the opera. It's terrible. So when I told old Spencer I had to go to the gym and get my equipment and stuff, that was a sheer lie. I don't even keep my goddamn equipment in the gym. Where I lived at Pensy, I lived in Austin Burger Memorial Wing of the new dorms. It was only for juniors and seniors. I was a junior. My roommate was a senior. It was named after this guy, Ossenberger, that went to Pensy. He made a pot of dough in the undertaking business after he got out of Pensy. What he did, he started these undertaking parlors all over the country that you could get members of your family buried for about five bucks a piece. You should see old Ossenberger. He probably just shoves them in a sack and dumps them in the river. Anyway, he gave Pensy a pile of dough and they named our wing after him first football game of the year, he came up to the school in this big goddamn Cadillac, and we all had to stand up in the grandstands and give him a locomotive. That's a cheer. Then the next morning in chapel, he made a speech that lasted about 10 hours. He started off with about 50 corny jokes just to show us what a regular guy he was. Very big deal. Then he started telling us how he was never ashamed. When he was in some kind of trouble or something, to get right down to get right down his, on his knees and pray to God. He told us we should always pray to God, talk to him and all, wherever we were. He told us we ought to think of Jesus as our buddy. He said he talked to Jesus all the time, even when he was driving his car. That killed me. I just see this big phony bastard shifting into first gear and asking Jesus to send him a few more stiffs. The only good part of his speech was right in the middle of it. He was telling us all about what a swell guy he was, what a hot shot and all. Then all of a sudden, this guy sitting in the row in front of me, Edgar Masala, laid this terrific fart. It was a very crude thing to do in chapel and all, but it was also quite amusing. Old Marsala, he damn near blew the roof off. Hardly anybody laughed out loud, and old Ossenberger made out like he didn't even hear it. But old Thurmer, the headmaster, was sitting right next to him on the rostrum and all, and you could tell he heard it. Boy, was he sore. He didn't say anything then. But the next night, he made us have compulsory study hall on the academic building, and he came up and made a speech. He said that the boy that had created the disturbance in chapel wasn't fit to go to Pensy. We tried to get old Marcel to rip off another one right while old Thurmer was making his speech, but he wasn't in the right mood. Anyway, that's where I, li where I lived at Pensy, old Ossenberger Memorial Way in the New Dorms. It was pretty nice to get back to my room after I left old Spencer because everybody was down at the game and the heat was on in our room for a change. It felt sort of cozy. I took off my coat and my tie and unbuttoned my shirt collar and then I put on this hat that I'd bought in New York that morning. It was this red hunting hat with one of those very, very long peaks. I saw it in the window of this sports store when we got out of the subway just after I noticed I'd lost all the goddamn foils. It only cost me a buck. The way I wore it, I swung the old peak way around to the back. Very corny, I'll admit, but I liked it that way. I looked good in it that way. Then I got this book I was reading and sat down in my chair. So just a quick pause. I would take a little note, maybe just a little star, this hat becomes a symbol, the red hunting hat, right? very symbolic in this story. So he talks about it here. Keep your eye out. It's going to keep coming up. The way that he wears it is important. Just an FYI. So something to take note of. So then I got this book I was reading and sat down in my chair. There were two chairs in every room. I had one and my roommate, Ward Str Stradlater, excuse me, Ward Stradlater had one. The arms were in sad shape because everybody was always sitting on them, but they were pretty comfortable chairs. 
The book I was reading was this book I took out of the library by mistake. They gave me the wrong book, and I didn't notice it till I got back to my room. They gave me Out of Africa by Isaac Dennison. I thought it was going to stink, but it didn't. It was a very good book. I'm quite illiterate, but I like to read. My favorite author is my brother DB, and my next favorite is Ring Lardner. My brother gave me a book by Ring Lardner for my birthday just before I went to Penn State. I had these very funny, crazy, it had these very funny, crazy plays in it, and then it had this one story about a traffic cop that falls in love with this very cute girl that's always speeding, only he's married, the cop, so he can't marry her or anything. Then this girl gets killed because she's always speeding. That story just about killed me. What I like best is a book that's at least funny once in a while. I read a lot of classical books, like The Return of the Native and all, and I like them. I read a lot of war books and mysteries and all, but they don't knock me out too much. What really knocks me out is a book that, when you're all done reading it, you wish the author that wrote it was a terrific friend of yours and you could call him up on the phone whenever you felt like it. That doesn't happen much, though. I wouldn't mind calling up Isaac Dennison up and Ring Lardner, except that DB told me he's dead. You take that book of Human Bondage by Somerset Maugham, though, I read it last summer. It's a pretty good book and all, but I wouldn't want to call up Somerset Maugham. I don't know. He just isn't the kind of guy I'd want to call up. That's all. I'd rather call up old Thomas Hardy. I like that Eustacia vibe. Anyway, I put on my new hat and sat down and started reading the book Out of Africa. I'd read it already, but I wanted to read certain parts over again. I'd only read about three pages, though, when I heard somebody coming through the shower curtains. Even without looking up, I knew right away who it was. It was Robert Ackley, this guy that roomed right next to me. There was a shower right between every two rooms in our wing, and about 85 times a day, old Ackley barged in on me. He was probably the only guy in the whole dorm besides me that wasn't down at the game. He hardly ever went anywhere. He was a very peculiar guy. He was a senior, and he'd been at Pensy the whole four years and all, but nobody ever called him anything except Ackley, not even Herb Gale, his own roommate. He even ever called him Bob, or even Ack. If he ever gets married, his own wife will probably call him Ackley. He was one of these very, very tall, round-shouldered guys. He was about six foot four with lousy teeth. The whole time he roomed next to me, I never even once saw him brush his teeth. They always looked mossy and awful, and he damn near made you sick if you saw him in the dining room with his mouth full of mashed potatoes and peas or something. Beside that, he had a lot of pimples, not just on his forehead or his chin, like most guys, but all over his whole face. And not only that, he had a terrible personality. He was sort of a nasty guy. I wasn't too crazy about him, to tell you the truth. I could feel him standing on the shower ledge, right behind my chair, taking a look to see if Stradlater was around. He hated Stradlater's guts. He never came in the room if Stradlater was around. He hated everybody's guts, damn near. He came down off the shower ledge and came into my room. Hi, he said. He always said it like he was terrifically bored or terrifically tired. He didn't want you to think he was visiting you or anything. He wanted you to think he'd come in by mistake, for God's sake. Hi, I said, but I didn't look up for my book. With a guy like Ackley, if you looked up from your book, you were a goner. You were a goner anyway, but not as quick if you didn't look up right away. He started walking around the room, very slow and all, the way he always did, picking up your personal stuff off desk, off a desk and chiffonier. He always picked up your personal stuff and looked at it. Boy, could he get on your nerves sometimes. How was the fencing, he said. He just wanted me to quit reading and enjoy myself. He didn't give a damn about the fencing. We win or what, he said. Nobody won, I said, without looking up, though. What, he said? He always made you say something twice. Nobody won, I said. I seemed to look to see what he was fiddling around with on my ship here. He was looking at this picture of this girl I used to go around with in New York, Sally Hayes. He must have picked up the goddamn book and looked at it at least 5,000 times since I got it. He always put it back in the wrong place, too, when he was finished. He did it on purpose. You could tell. Nobody won, he said. How come? I left the goddamn foils and stuff on the subway. I still didn't even look up at him. On the subway? For Christ's sakes, you lost them, you mean? We got on the wrong subway. I had to keep get I had to keep getting up to look at the goddamn map on the wall. He came over and stood right in my light. Hey, I said, I've read this same sentence about 25 times since you've come in. Anybody else except Ackley would have taken the goddamn hint. Not him though. Think they'll make you pay for him, he said. I don't know, and I don't give a damn. 
How about sitting down or something, Ackley kid? You're right in my goddamn lane. He didn't like it when you called him Ackley kid. He was always telling me I was a goddamn kid because I was 16 and he was 18. It drove me him mad when I called him Ackley kid. He kept standing there. He was exactly the kind of guy that wouldn't get out of your light when you asked him to. He'd do it, finally, but it took him a lot longer if you asked him to. What the hell are you reading, he said. Goddamn book. He shoved my book back with his hand so he could see the name on it. Any good, he said. This sentence I'm reading is terrific. I can be quite sarcastic when I'm in the mood. He didn't get it, though. He started walking around the room again, picking up all my personal stuff and Stradlevers. Finally, I put my book down on the floor. You couldn't read anything with a guy like, like Ackley around. It was impossible. I slid way the hell down in my chair and watched old Ackley making himself at home. I was feeling sort of tired from the trip to New York and all, and I started yawning. Then I started horsing around a little bit. Sometimes I horse around quite a lot just to keep from getting bored. What I did was I pulled the old peak of my hunting hat around to the front. And then I pulled it way down over my eyes. That way I couldn't see a goddamn thing. I think I'm going blind, I said in this very hoarse voice. Mother darling, everything's getting so dark in here. You're nuts, I swear to God, Ackley said. Mother darling, give me your hand. Why won't you give me your hand? For Christ's sakes, grow up. I started groping around in front of me like a blind guy, without getting up or anything. I kept saying, Mother darling, why won't you give me your hand? I was only horsing around naturally. That stuff gives me a bang sometimes. Besides, I know it annoyed the hell out of old Ackley. He finally brought out the old status to me. I was pretty sadistic with him quite often. Finally, I quit though. I pulled the peak around to the back again and relaxed. Who belongs to this? Ackley said. He was holding my roommate's knee supporter up to show me. That guy Ackley pick up anything. He'd even pick up your jockstrap or something. I told him it was Stradlater's, so he chucked it on Stradlater's bed. He got it off Stradlater's chiffonier, so he chucked it on the bed. He came over and sat down on the arm of Stradlater's chair. He never sat down on, in a chair, just always on the arm. Where the hell did you get that, he said. New York. How much? A buck. You got robbed. He started cleaning his goddamn fingernails with the end of a match. He was always cleaning his fingernails. It was funny in a way. His teeth were always mossy looking, and his ears were always dirty as hell. But he was always cleaning his fingernails. I guess he thought that made him a very neat guy. He took another look at my hat while he was cleaning them. Up home, we wear a hat like that to shoot deer in, for Christ's sakes, he said. That's a deer shooting hat. Like hell it is. I took it off and looked at it. I sort of closed one eye, like I was taking aim at it. This is a people shooting hat, I said. I shoot people in this hat. Your folks know you get kicked out? You, Your folks know you get kicked out yet? Nope. Where the hell's Stradlater at? Sorry, where the hell's Stradlater at, anyway? Down at the game, he's got a date, I yawn. I was yawning all over the place for one thing. The room was too damn hot. It made you sleepy. At Pensy, you either froze to death or died of the heat. The great Stradlater actually said, hey, lend me your scissors a second, will ya? You got them handy? No, I packed them already. They're way in the top of the closet. Get them a second, will ya? Ackley said, I got this hangnail I want to cut off. He didn't care if he'd packed something or not and had it way in the top of the closet. I got them for him. I nearly got killed doing it too. The second I opened the closet door, Stradlater's tennis racket and his wooden press and all fell right on my head. It made a big clump and it hurt like hell. Damn near killed old Ackley though. He started laughing in this very high falsetto voice. He kept laughing the whole time I was taking down my suitcase and getting the scissors out for him. Something like that. A guy getting hit on the head with a rock or something. Tickle the pants off, Ackley. You have a goddamn sense of humor, Ackley kid, I told him. You know that? I handed him the scissors. Let me be your manager. I'll get you on the goddamn radio. I sat down in my chair again and he started cutting his big horn horny looking nails. How about using the table or something? I said, cut them over the table, will ya? I don't feel like walking on your crummy nails in my bare feet tonight. He kept right on cutting them over the floor, though. What lousy manners. I mean it. Who's Stradlater's date, he said. He was always keeping tabs on who Stradlater was dating, even though he hated Stradlater's guts. I don't know why. No reason. Boy, I can't stand that son of a bitch. He's one son of a bitch I really can't stand. He's crazy about you. He told me he thinks you're a goddamn prince, I said. I call people a prince quite often when I'm horsing around. It keeps me from getting bored or something. 
He's got the superior attitude all the time, Ackley said. I just can't stand the son of a bitch. You think he, do you mind cutting your nails over the table, hey? I said, I've asked you about fit. He's got this goddamn superior attitude all the time, Ackley said. I don't even think the son of a bitch is intelligent. He thinks he is. He thinks he's about the most Ackley for grace sakes. Will you please cut your crummy nails over the table? I've asked you 50 times. He started cutting his nails over the table for a change. The only way he ever did anything was if you yelled at him. I watched him for a while. Then I said, the reason you're sore at Strad later is because he said that stuff about brushing your teeth once in a while. He didn't mean to insult you for crying out loud. He didn't say it right or anything, but he didn't mean anything insulting. All he meant was you'd look better and feel better if you sort of brush your teeth once in a while. I brush my teeth. Don't give me that. No, you don't. I've seen you and you don't, I said. I didn't say it nasty, though. I felt sort of sorry for him in a way. I mean, it isn't too nice, naturally, if somebody tells you you don't brush your teeth. Stradlater's all right. He's not too bad, I said. You don't know him. That's the trouble. I still say he's a son of a bitch. He's a conceited son of a bitch. He's conceited, but he's very generous in some things. He really is, I said. Look, suppose, for instance, Stradlater was wearing a tie or something that you like. Say, he had a tie on that you liked a hell of a lot. I'm just giving you an example now. You know what he'd do? He'd probably take it off and give it to you. He really would. Or you know what he'd do? He'd leave it on your bed or something. But he'd give you the goddamn tie. Most guys would probably just, hell, Ackley said. If I had his dough, I would too. No, you wouldn't. I shook my head. No, you wouldn't, Ackley kid. If you had his dough, you'd be one of the biggest. Stop calling me Ackley kid. God damn it. I'm too old to be your lousy father. No, you're not. Boy, he could really be aggravating sometimes. He never missed a chance to get let you know you were 16 and he was 18. In the first place, I wouldn't let you in my goddamn family, I said. Well, just cut out calling me. All of a sudden, the door opened and old Stradlater barged in in a big hurry. He was always in a big hurry. Everything was a very big deal. He came over to me and gave me these two playful as hell slaps on both cheeks, which is something that can be very annoying. Listen, he said, you going out anywhere special tonight? I don't know. I might. What the hell's it doing out? Snowing? He had snow all over his coat. Yeah, listen, if you're not going out anyplace special, how about lending me your houndstooth jacket? Who won the game, I said. It's only the half. We're leaving, Stradlater said. No kidding. You gonna use your hound's tooth tonight or not? I spilled some crap all over my gray flannel. No, but I don't want you stretching it with your goddamn shoulders and all, I said. We were practically the same height, but he weighed about twice as much as I did. He had these very broad shoulders. I won't stretch it. He went over to the closet in a big hurry. How's a boy, Ackley? He said to Ackley. He was at least a pretty friendly guy. Stradlater was partly a phony kind of friendly, but at least he always said hello to Ackley and all. Ackley just sort of grunted when he said, how's a boy? He wouldn't answer him, but he didn't have, he wouldn't answer him, but he didn't have guts enough to at least grunt. Then he said to me, I think I'll get going. See you later. Okay, I said. He never exactly broke your heart when he went back to his own room. Old Stradlater started taking off his coat and tie and all. I think maybe I'll take a fast shave, he said. He had a pretty heavy beard. He really did. Who's your date, I asked. She's waiting in the annex. He went out of the room with his toilet kit and towel under his arm. No shirt on or anything. He always walked around in his bare torso because he thought he had a, he had a damn good build. He did, too. I have to admit it. All right, and then chapter four is about to begin. This is page 14. So that was... Um, Ackley, for the most part, we meet Stradlater at the end. And again, just taking note that we're looking at characterization. So we find out about Holden, because Holden's the narrator, but we also find out about this Ackley and Stradlater. So a lot of what we find out about in this chapter about Stradlater is indirect characterization. We find out about it through this conversation that Ackley and Holden are having. In the next chapter, when we actually talk to when we talk to Strad later, there will be some more direct characterization. And then in this chapter, sorry, my dog's barking on us. Um, in this chapter, 
we find out directly about Ackley, right? We've got, you know, him cutting his fingernails, Holden just describing how gross he is, and that's, you know, Salinger using direct characterization about his fingernails and his teeth and his ears and his manners, right? That's all some direct characterization. But again, when they're having this conversation and we find out just some more nuances about the characters based on the conversation and the actions, right? That's indirect. So keep looking at that as we continue to chapter four. Um, and chapter four, again, starts on, there's this four random at the bottom of page um, 14, but it starts at the top of page 15. So Ackley leaves, he goes back to his room, and we have Stradlater rushing in here. Um, it's the evening, he's about to go out on a date, and he and Holden are gonna have a conversation before he leaves. So this is, again, chapter four, Stradlater. This is Holden's actual roommate. All right, page 15. I didn't have anything special to do, so I went down to the can and chewed the rag with him while he was shaving. We were the only ones in the can because everybody was still at the game. It was hot as hell and the windows were all steam. There were about 10 wash bowls, all right against the wall. Stradlater had the middle one. I sat down on the one right next to him and started turning the cold water on and off, this nervous habit I have. Stradlater kept whistling Song of India while he shaved. He had one of those very piercing whistles that are practically never in tune. And he always picked out some song that's hard to whistle, even if you're a good whistle, whistler, like Song of India or Slaughter on 10th Avenue. He could really mess up a song. You remember I said before that Ackley was a slob in his personal habits? Well, so is Stradlater, but in a different way. So this is all direct characterization. Stradlater was more of a secret slob. He always looked all right, Stradlater, but for instance, you should have seen the razor he shaved himself with. It was always rusty as hell and full of leather and hairs and crap. He never cleaned it or anything. He always looked good when he was finished fixing himself up, but he was a secret slob anyway. If you knew him the way I did, the reason he fixed himself up to look good was because he was madly in love with himself. He thought he was the handsomest guy in the Western Hemisphere. He was pretty handsome too, I'll admit it, but he's mostly the kind of handsome that if your parents saw his picture in the yearbook, they'd right away say, who's this boy? I mean, he was mostly a yearbook kind of handsome. I knew a lot of guys at Pensy I thought were a lot handsomer than Stradlater, but they wouldn't look handsome if you saw their picture in the yearbook. They'd look like they had big noses or their ears stuck out. I've had that experience quite frequently. Anyway, I was sitting on the wash pole next to where Stradlater was shaving, sort of turning the water on and off. I still had my red hunting hat on with the peak around to the back and all, and I really got a bang out of that. So again, paying attention to that hat and the way Holden wears the hat and how he's feeling when he has that hat in a certain position. All things that sort of, that's indirect characterization. Hey, Stradlater said, wanna do me a big favor? What, I said, not too enthusiastic. He was always asking you to do him a big favor. You take a very handsome guy or a guy that thinks is a real hot shot and they're always asking you to do them a big favor just because they're crazy about themselves then they think you're crazy about them too and that you're just dying to do them a favor. It's sort of funny in a way. You going out tonight, he said. I might, I might not, I don't know why. I got about a hundred pages to read for history for Monday, he said. How about writing a composition for me for English? I'll be up the creek if I don't get the goddamn thing in by Monday. The reason I ask, how about it? It was very ironical. It really was. I'm the one that's flunking out of the goddamn place and you're asking me to write you a goddamn composition? I said, yeah, I know. The thing is though, I'll be up a creek if I don't get it in. Be a buddy, be a better root, okay? I didn't answer him right away. Suspense is good for some bastards like Stradlater. What on, I said. Anything, anything descriptive, a room or a house or something you once lived in, or something, you know, just as long as it's descriptive as hell. He gave out a big yawn while he said that, which is something that gives me a royal pain in the ass. I mean, if somebody yawns right while they're asking you to do them a goddamn favor, just don't do it too good, is all he said. That son of a bitch, Harslet, thinks you're a hotshot in English, and he knows you're my roommate. So, I mean, don't stick all the commas in the, and stuff in the right place. 
that's something else that gives me a royal pain. I mean, if you're good at writing compositions and somebody starts talking about commas, Stratleader was always doing that. He wanted you to think that the only reason he was lousy at writing compositions was because he stuck all the commas in the wrong place. He was a little bit like Ackley that way. I once sat next to Ackley at this basketball game. We had a terrific guy on the team, Howie, Cow Howie Coyle, that could sink them from the middle of the floor without even touching the backboard or anything. Ackley kept saying the whole goddamn game that Coyle had a perfect build for basketball. God, how I hate that stuff. I got bored sitting on that wash bowl after a while, so I backed up a few feet and started doing this tap dance just for the hell of it. I was just amusing myself. I can't really tap dance or anything, but it was a stone floor in the can and it was good for tap dancing. I started imitating one of those guys in the movies, in one of those musicals. I hate the movies like Poison, but I get a bang, imitate, I get a bang out of imitating them. Old Stradler watched me in the mirror while he was shaving. All I need is an audience. I'm an exhibitionist. I'm the god darn governor's son, I said. I was knocking myself out, tap dancing all over the place. He doesn't want me to be a tap dancer. He wants me to go to Oxford, but it's in my goddamn blood, tap dancing. Old Stradlater laughed. He didn't have too bad of a sense of humor. It's opening night at the Ziegfeld Follies. I was getting out of breath. I have hardly any wind at all. The leading man can't go on. He's drunk as a bastard. So who do they get to take his place? Me, that's who, the little old goddamn governor's son. Where'd you get that hat, Stratlater said. He meant my hunting hat. He'd never seen it before. I was out of breath anyway, so I quit horsing around. I took off my hat and looked at it for about the 19th, 90th time. I got it in New York this morning for a buck. You like it? Stratlater nodded. Sharp, he said. He was only flattering me though, because right away he said, listen, are you gonna write that composition for me? I have to know. If I get the time, I will. If I don't, I won't, I said. I went over and sat down at the wash bowl next to him again. Who's your date, I asked him, Fitzgerald? Hell no, I told you, I'm done with that pig. Yeah, give her to me, boy. No kidding, she's my type. Take her, she's too old for you. All of a sudden, for no reason, really except that I was sort of in the mood for horsing around, I felt like jumping off the washbowl and getting an old Stradlater and a half Nelson. That's a wrestling hold, in case you don't know, where you get the other guy around the neck and choke him to death, if you feel like it. So I did it. I landed on him like a goddamn panther. Cut it out, Holden, for Christ's sake, Stradlater said. He didn't feel like horsing around. He was shaving and all. What do you want, want to make me do, cut my goddamn head off? I didn't, I didn't let go, though. I had a pretty good half Nelson on him. Liberate yourself from my vice-like grip, I said. Jesus Christ, he put down his razor and all of a sudden jerked his arms up and sort of broke my hold on him. He was a very strong guy. I'm a very weak guy. Now cut out that crap, he said. He started shaving himself all over again. He always shaved himself twice to look gorgeous with his crummy old razor. Who's your date if it isn't Fitzgerald? I asked him. I sat down on the wash bowl next to him again. That Phyllis Smith babe? No, I was supposed to. It was supposed to be, but the arrangements got all screwed up. I got Bud Thaw's girl's roommate now. Hey, I almost forgot. She knows you. Who does? I said. My date. Yeah, I said. What's her name? I was pretty interested. I'm thinking. Uh, Jean Gallagher. Boy, I nearly dropped dead when he said that. Jane Gallagher, I said. I even got up off the washbowl when he said that. I damn near dropped dead. You're damn right I know her. She practically lived right next door to me this summer before last. She had this big damned over in Pincher. That's how I met her. Her dog used to keep coming over in our... You're right in my light, Holden, for Christ's sake, Stradlater said. You have to stand right there. Boy, was I excited, though. I really was. Where is she, I asked. I ought to go down and say hello to her or something. Where is she? In the annex? Yeah. How'd she happen to mention me? Does she go to BM now? She said she might go there. She said she might go to Shipley too. I thought she went to Shipley. How'd she happen to mention me? I was pretty excited. I really was. I don't know. For Christ's for Christ sakes, lift up, will you? You're on my towel, Stradlater said. I was sitting on a stupid towel. Jane Gallagher, I said. I couldn't get over it. Jesus H, H Christ. Old Stradlater was putting Vitalis on his hair. My Vitalis. She's a dancer, I said. Ballet and all. She used to practice about two hours every day, right in the middle of the hottest weather and all. She was worried that it might make her legs look lousy. All thick or something. And I used to play checkers with her all the time. You used to play with her? You used to play what with her all the time? 
checkers, checkers for Christ's sakes. Yeah, she wouldn't move any of her kings. What she'd do when she'd get a king, she wouldn't move it. She'd just leave it in the back row. She'd get them all lined up in the back row. Then she'd never use them. She just liked the way they looked when they were all in the back row. Stradlater didn't say anything. That kind of stuff doesn't interest most people. Her mother belonged to the same club as we did, I said. I used to caddy once in a while just to make some dough. I caddied for her mother a couple of times. She went around about 170 for nine holes. Stradlater wasn't hardly listening. He was combing his gorgeous locks. I ought to go down and at least say hello to her, I said. Why don't you? I will in a minute. He started parting his hair all over again. I, it took him about an hour to comb his hair. Her mother and father were divorced. Her mother was married again to some booze hound, I said. Skinny guy with hairy legs, I remember. He wore shorts all the time. Jane said he was supposed to be a playwright or some goddamn thing, but all I ever saw him do was booze all the time and listen to every single goddamn mystery program on the radio and run around the goddamn house naked with Jane around and all. Yeah, Stradlater said. That really interested him about the booze hound running around the house naked with Jane around. Stradlater was a very sexy bastard. She had a lousy childhood. I'm not kidding. That didn't interest Stradlater, though. Only very sexy stuff interested in him. Jane Gallagher. Jesus, I couldn't get her off my mind. I really couldn't. I ought to go down and say hello to her at least. Why the hell don't you instead of keep saying it, Stradlater said. I walked over to the window, but she couldn't see out of it. It was so steamy from the heat in the can. Not in the mood right now, I said. It wasn't either. You have to be in the mood for those things. I thought she went to Shipley. I could have sworn she went to Shipley. I walked around the can for a little while. I didn't have anything else to do. Did she enjoy the game, I said. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. Did she tell you we used to play checkers all the time or anything? I don't know. For Christ's sakes, I only just met her, Stradlater said. He's finished combing his goddamn gorgeous hair. He's putting away all his crummy toilet articles. Listen, give her my regards, will ya? Okay, Stradlater said. But I knew you probably wouldn't. You take a guy like Stradlater, they never give your regards to people. He went back to the room, but I stuck around in the can for a while, thinking about old Jean. Then I went back to the room too. Stradlater was putting on his tie in front of the mirror. When I got there, he spent about, around half his goddamn life in front of the mirror. I sat down in my chair and sort of watched him for a while. Hey, I said, don't tell her I got kicked out, will ya? Okay. He, that was one good thing about Stradlater. You didn't have to explain every goddamn little thing with him the way you had to do with Ackley. Mostly, I guess, because he wasn't too interested. That's really why. Ackley, it was different. Ackley was a very nosy bastard. He put on my hound's tooth jacket. Jesus, now try not to stretch it all over the, stretch it out all over the place, I said. I'd only worn it about twice. I won't. Where the hell's my cigarettes? On the desk. I never knew where he left anything. Under your muffler. He put them on, he put them in his coat pocket. My coat pocket. I pulled the peak of my hunting hat around to the front all of a sudden for a change. I was getting sort of nervous all of a sudden. Quite a nervous guy. Listen, where are you going on your date with her? I asked, you know? I don't know. New York, if we have time. She only signed out for 930, for Christ's sakes. I didn't like the way he said it. So I said, the reason she did that, she probably just didn't know what a handsome, charming bastard you are. If she'd known, she probably would have signed out for 9.30 in the morning. Goddamn right, Stradlater said. You couldn't rile him too easily. He was too conceited. No kidding now. Do that composition for me, he said. He had his coat on and he was all ready to go. Don't knock yourself out or anything, but just make it descriptive as hell, okay? I didn't answer him. I didn't feel like it. All I said was, ask her if she still keeps her kings all in the back row. Okay, Stradlater said. But I knew he wouldn't. Take it easy now. He banged the hell out of the room. I sat there for about a half an hour after he left. I mean, I just sat in my chair not doing anything. I kept thinking about Jane and about Stradlater having a date with her and all. It made me so nervous. I nearly went crazy. I already told you what a sexy bastard Stradlater was. All of a sudden, Ackley barged in again, though, through the damn shower curtains, as usual. For once in my stupid life, I was really glad to see him. He took my mind off the other stuff. He stuck around till around dinner time, talking about all the guys at Pensy that he hated their guts and squeezing this big pimple on his chin. He didn't even use his handkerchief. I don't even think the bastard had a handkerchief. If you want to know the truth, I never saw him use one anyway. 
chapter five. So we're going to stop our reading there. I'm going to get back in and stop my screen share. Hey, so that was chapters three and four, and we met these guys that live in Holden's dorm. We met his roommate, Stradlater, and we met the neighbor, Athlete. They're foils, they're opposite. They contrast with each other, and um, Salinger introduces them back to back so that the reader can really see how different they are. And we have that direct characterization where um, we find out through exact description about these characters. And then we have indirect characterization. So we have indirect characterization of Ackley and Stradlater, but also of Holden and also of Jane Gallagher. So I, direct characterization is obvious, right? It's like this direct description of what somebody looks like. That's easy to find. Um, I like the indirect um, characterization. I like, you know, analyzing how Holden's wearing his hat becomes a symbol and how just the descriptions of when he turns his hat backwards with the peak around you know back and he's feeling confident and then when he's feeling a little bit nervous he turns it forwards and he has the peak concealing his face a little bit more so just things to pay attention to and and i really do like that detail in the book and and salinger will keep using his hat for the reader to sort of see how Holden is feeling. It almost becomes a symbol of Holden's feelings, which is like, I love that. Um, and then Jane Gallagher too, right? We find out about Jane and Holden gives us some direct descriptions of how they met. And then he tells us a little bit about her life and this detail, again, it's all in the details, right? Of how she keeps all of the kings in the back row when she plays checkers. And he says, she just liked the way it looked. But if you think about that strategy, if you play checkers, I mean, maybe this is like go out and play a game of checkers. Um, if you think about keeping all of the kings in the back row, that's a very defensive strategy. And as Holden shares with us some details of Jane's life, you, you wonder what's going on there. Like she, maybe there's reason why she acts in a defensive way or appreciates, you know, defensive strategies. So just things that are more subtle, that's indirect characterization. Same thing, um, paying attention to how he talks about Stradlater. There's, yes, Stradlater's conceited. He's that, you know, I shouldn't say these words, you know, over the video broadcast. But he's that guy that like, you know, everybody's just like, Ah, oh, this guy, right? He's cocky, he's conceited, he thinks he's great. He has no problem borrowing things from you and then asking you to do him a favor at the same time. And like, you know, just somebody who totally will take advantage in every possible way. So talking about privileges and entitlement, Stradlater is that guy. He screams entitled, privileged brat, right? And Holden worries about that. He's like, oh, this entitled privileged guy that always is used to getting what he wants, going out with Jane, who Holden, you know, is, is fond of. And he, he says he sits for half an hour. This is indirect characterization too. Half an hour after Stradlater leaves, just, just wondering and sort of worrying about that date. And so we'll, we'll get a little bit more of that in the chapters to come. And then Ackley too, Ackley is, is gross and he's, you know, got that description, that direct characterization of how much of a slob he is. But at the same time, you know, he almost comforts Holden in a way. He's like predictable and he's not going to take advantage of Holden in the same way that Stradlater might. He's not going to ask him, you know, to go out of his way to do him a favor and then just kind of let the door hit him as he walks out. Um, he's just like a, a bit of an annoyance, but he seems pretty harmless. For Strad later, you have to wonder, like, hmm, this guy, there's just something that m leaves Holden and the reader a little bit uneasy about a Strad later character. Um, so we'll, we'll keep looking at that, and that is indirect characterization. But so yeah, these two chapters, chapter three and four, we've got um, more characters being introduced, finding out more about Holden as he prepares to leave school, because we know that he's been kicked out. So with that, keep your eyes out for that characterization assignment on Schoology. We're going to have a little fun playing around with that um, technique. 
and you know be cool i hope you're doing well out there and we'll be back for chapter five all right see you later